Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So good to see our beautiful faces again today. <laughs> I trust that God who has brought us to this place tonight is going to meet us at the point of our knees in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you because no man can come to you, Lord Jesus, and said they have been drawn by your Father. Thank you because the Father has brought us together tonight. Lord, we ask that let your word have its perfect place in our midst in the name of Jesus. Amen. Help us, Lord, to be established in our faith via your word tonight in the name of Jesus. And help us to know how to take our place in destiny, in life, in purpose, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Uh, tonight we are going to be dealing with something that is very personal for each and every one of us. There is none of us that is exempted from what God has brought for us tonight. For those who are worshipping, who are fellowshipping with us on the internet, you want to say thank you for joining me. God who has brought you is going to reach out to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Tonight we'll be looking at what has been tapped, what the Lord is looking for in this vessel. What the Lord is looking for in this vessel. Now, more than anything else, all of us, we admit that the Lord is the sovereign God, is the sovereign ruler. He rules over the affairs of men. Now, we understand that he is the one, the Bible says, he is the one that sits upon the circles of the head, and the inhabitants of the head are like grasshoppers before him. There was a time he said, by myself, I spread the curtains of the heavens. Now, we know him that he is not just the maker of the heavens and the earth, he actually rules the affairs of men on the earth, and is in charge completely in heaven. So, in the universe, the Lord rules. Do we start with that understanding? Amen. There is nothing that happens in the universe. You know, some time ago, I was meditating and I realized that even the devil does not do anything outside God's purpose. The devil doesn't have any authority, any power to do anything away or against the will of God. You remember the story of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. God said, for this purpose I have raised you. You know, the, the scripture now went further to talk about those who are vessels of wrath and those who are vessels unto honor. Pharaoh was made, was raised up by God as a vessel of his wrath. Say that I may show my power. So even Pharaoh, who we believe was acting as he was influenced and possessed by the demons, was still doing the will of the Father. So nothing happens on this earth that the Lord does not permit. Nothing happens on this earth that the Lord does not give a go-ahead to. Nothing happens outside the authority of God. So the Lord has authority over every activity, every affair on earth and in heaven. That was very clear to us. You remember that um, there was a time, I mean, not even a time, in several instances in the book of the prophet, in the books of the prophet, when certain words come from God, they usually help with this word. God says, or says the Lord of hosts. Now, one of the things that we mustn't forget is that the host represents everything that the Lord creates. So we have the host of heaven, we have the host of the earth. The Lord is not just the Lord of the host of heaven, it's also the Lord of the host on the earth. Now, every host tends toward the direction of God. There is no host that turns away from God's purpose. That host we must survive it. So we mustn't forget that our Lord, our God is the Lord of hosts. He's the one who rules over his host. And his host respond to his dictate. They respond to his bidding. They respond to his direction. They don't do anything without, without seeking his consent. 
Now, the scripture says in Romans chapter 8, as many that are led by the sons by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Now, unlike us, the owners of God, they are led by God. They don't say, okay, today I will listen to God, tomorrow I will listen to God. They yield to the word of God. Now, let us move from there. There's a place in the book of Psalm, in the book of the Psalmist, in Psalms chapter 115, verse 16, there's a portion there that gives a clear picture of what takes place. Psalms 115, verse 16. The scripture says, The heaven, even the heavens, are the Lord's, but the earth he has given to the children of men. Now we started by saying the Lord is the Lord of hosts. Is the ruler over the universe. Is the one that says a thing and is established. Nothing happens on this earth and in heaven outside his will. Now he has spoken and the ocean maintains hmm, its dimension and its scope. By his word, boundaries are given to the waters on the earth and in the, anywhere the waters are. So, that we even says it in Hebrews, that everything is sustained by the word of his power. Is the supreme God, is the supreme ruler over the affairs of men. Now, I mean, supreme authority over the affairs of the universe, he decided to delegate a portion of his authority, a portion of his sovereignty to men. So the scripture says in Psalms 115 verse 16, the heavens, the heaven, even the heavens, belongs to the Lord. So the Lord is the owner of the heaven, so he is the Lord of heaven and earth. Now he chose to give the earth to the children of men. So what we have as a, ch as a child, or as a son, as a, as a daughter, what we have as children of men is what has been handed over to us by God. Out of his own love. Now, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, we know the place, but I will just go over it. God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish, and over the best of the head, and over the cattle, over all the head, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Don't forget, I'm saying the heaven belongs to God. Even the heavens belongs to God. Now the head he has given to the children of men. This is how God gave the head to the children of men. He says, let us make man in our image. We are living and inhabiting and ruling over the affairs of heaven. Let us make them to have dominion over everything on the earth. You remember everything that creeps on the earth. Everything that creeps. Everything. Everything in the sea. Everything in the air. I give you the authority over. So the question now is, why nothing happens on the earth and in the heavens outside the authority of God, does it mean that God directly does everything or works everything or is the one that people see everywhere at every time? Now let me give us an instance. In that same book of Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 1, when there was darkness, Bible says, and God said, let there be light. There was, and there was light. Now there was darkness. Mr. Bella, the problem of the head was a problem of darkness. When God wanted to solve the problem, even though he solved the problem by his word, the problem, the, the, the host of God that became a solution to the problem was light. So God created light. And as long as the, the light existed, there was no darkness. So that, that light was the solution to the problem of darkness. And yet, that light is the product of God's word. That light is sustained by the word of God. So God controls, God rules in the affairs of all men, yet God doesn't do it directly. He, do, he, he does it through certain other men. Now, we saw the example about light. God solves the problem of darkness by creating light. And as long as its light is in a place 
there will be no darkness. So when you have light, you shouldn't still be looking to God and say, God, why is there darkness? There should not be darkness when the light is there. So when God wants to solve problems, he creates. And among the creations of God are we, the children of men. And so when God wants to solve certain problems, God doesn't need to be there physically. He sends us. So as long as we are there, the problems are solved. As long as we are there, the problems are taken care of. The question is, how many of us in our generation are taking ownership, taking responsibility for different problems around us? Now, what we are dealing with is what the Lord is looking for in his vessel. The vessel is literally a container that bears an object or bears a content that carries a thing. So if, uh, let me use your bottle now. Now, there is water inside this bottle. If there is no bottle, there will be no water in my hand. I need water, but I cannot grab water. So for me to enjoy water, I must lay hold onto the bottle. So the bottle is the vessel that pierces the water. Water is a solution to my thirst. Water will give me life. Yet I cannot enjoy the water until there is a vessel that helps me to lay hold onto it. So we are vessels of God. But the truth is, how many of us are really the vessel that the Lord has found? Don't forget, the Lord is looking for certain things. He's looking for certain things in his vessels. If he can't find the, vessel, the things in those vessels, even though they claim to be vessels, they will not be the solution for providing vessels of God. All right. So when things go wrong in our society, in our churches, in our families, when things go wrong in our finances, in our marriages, what do we do? What an average man does is to say, ah, God, why me? Ah, God, what are you doing there? You are there and you are allowing these things to happen to me. We, look, we face God and say, ah, what are you doing? See what is happening to me. Okay, we don't even do like that all the time. Sometimes we say, God, what are you doing? See what is happening in Nigeria. Lord, what are you doing? See what is happening in my city. In fact, see the way these people are conducted. See the way the education in Nigeria has become something else. See, Lord, what are you doing? Lord, what will you do? Imagine there was no harvest last year. There was no correct harvest. There was no rain. Lord, what are you doing? You have stopped the rain from falling. When things don't go well, we quickly complain and send the blame, send the responsibility to God. Yet, there is an host, there is, an, there is a creation of God who is in charge of that rain that you are looking for. There is a creation of God who is made by God to solve that problem that you are complaining about. So, what are these creations doing that makes it look that God is not doing things? What are we doing as creations that make it look like God is not working? Jesus said, my father walketh either to I walk. My father is always walking and walking. Why God is walking? Why do we idle ourselves everywhere? Making God look like an idle God. Whereas each time people complain to him about certain problems, he looks down, saying, ah, why did I put it there? Did I create you for that same purpose? Stop this imagine. Imagine darkness in Nigeria for three days. And God is looking at the sun. Did I create it to shine light upon these people? There are creations of God meant to solve the problems on the earth. So, are you a solution to the problems or you are also one of the problems? <laughs> Amen. Amen. The Lord is looking down for men and women who can take their place, who can own up to situations. Imagine some people that said, what someone, somebody that said, give me Scotland or like that. Somebody who saw Scotland in error and who was not willing to cast the blame to God, but wanted to take responsibility for 
the salvation of Scotland. I said, Lord, give me Scotland or like that. Now, if God decides to express himself through the man, don't be jealous of him. No, he has just taken responsibility to solve a problem that he was actually created to solve. He says, let us make man in our image. Now, God is needed everywhere. Why? He's the ruler. He's the judge of all. He's the supreme God. He's the supreme majesty. He's the king of glory. He is the God of all gods. Now, he's needed. God has now created you. He has now created you. He has created you in his image according to his likeness. So you share his nature. You share his attributes. There are certain things that people are looking for and you have it. God put it in you. Why? So that when men are looking for solutions, they will find it in you. So that we don't become a problem to you. Why should we actually become a problem when we are being made in the image and the likeness of the solution provider, of the creator, the creator, the one who creates, the one who doesn't need a thing to exist for him to even create something. He creates out of nothing. He makes a new thing to come out out of nothing. Some people must get something and build on it. God builds on nothing. He can build on nothing. It's such a glorious God. It's such a supreme God. There's a place I want us to look at in Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 10. Because, you know, when there was darkness across the earth, what God did was to say, let there be light. And as soon as he did that, the darkness that had prevailed over the head became a thing of the past. So when there was an issue with sin with mankind, when man was not in touch with his creator, when men couldn't hear from God, when the voice of God was cast in the days of old, when there was no direction, when there was no passion of God, when there was no love of God in the heart of people, when people were following the law, not the law, when people were doing God's work, not according to law, but according to law, there was a problem. Now, when God wanted to fix the problem, God sent Christ. Now, when Christ came, <laughs> Christ did not come as a roaming spirit, a spirit that was just roaming around, moving around the streets, moving around the nations. He didn't come as an angel. He came as the Son of Man. And the reason is simple. The earth belongs to God. The earth he has given to the children of men. So when there is a need for solution on the earth, God doesn't send an angel to go and provide solution. God sends a man. God sends a woman. Now, Jesus was to be introduced. But there was a need for another vessel, another creation, to announce the arrival of the coming king. God didn't send an angel to announce the arrival and just left it to an angel. God actually sent a man. A man who was to be like another, be like other men, look like other men, relate with other men. God will always send men to solve the problems of men. So when you see a problem around you, don't be looking for one angel to come and solve it. It has to be solved by him. It has to be solved by me. It has to be solved by us. For instance, in Nigeria, many of us just believe <laughs> that was a, there were some quotes that were going on, going on on Twitter some time ago. When Obama left presidency in the United States, some people were saying, Obama, will Obama come and take over the presidency in the jail? Will he come and contest? Some people said, we can just contest him away. Later, we heard that France, too, was interested in making him president. Now, the truth is, why many of us would wish that the Nigerian problem would be solved by Obama in that contest if he can become president? Our problem will really be solved when a Nigerian owns up to the problem of this country, takes responsibility to fix Nigeria, not a foreigner coming to rule us. That's how it works. Now, in this way, too, an angel will not be a solution to the problem of mankind. It is a man, it is a woman. Hebrews chapter 10. 
I want us to read from verse 5. Hebrews 10 from verse 5. I will read from here. It says, Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come in the volume of the book. It is written on me to do your will, O God. Now, if we read the scripture in Psalms, it looks more interesting than this one. He said, I delight to do your will, O God. I've come in the volume of books that is written on me. I delight to do your will, O God. That's the word of Christ. The Bible says, when he came to the world, that's what he said. He said, sacrifice and offerings you did not desire. He said, a body you have prepared for me. A body you have prepared for me. Now, behold, <laughs> look very carefully. Behold, look very carefully. I have come. I have come. I have come. I've come in the bottom of books that is written on me. I've come. I've come according to the books written on me. According to the word of God, I have come. By the word of God, I have arrived. Now, I have not just arrived. I delight to do your will, O God. Amen. What God is looking for everywhere, every time, in every generation, is somebody that wants to do it. Stabis is saying, I delight. He didn't say it in that Hebrews, but in Psalms, he says, I delight to do your will, you God. In the volume of book written of me, I've come to do your will, you God. Stabis, see how many of us can say confidently? That I am not here, I am not here to complain, to be a problem. What I'm here to do is to do your will, God. What I'm here to do is to do your will, you God. The question is, what is the will of God? Remember, we said God is the ruler over the affairs of men. Yet he rules in the affairs of men. True men. Now, the will of God is having the needs of men. Taken care of by the man that represents him, by the man that he sends to the world. Bible says, talking about Christ, when he came, that is how we are we have been created and we have been designed to emerge. We have been designed to emerge in our generation as a solution to the problems around us. We've been designed to emerge as a solution. And Bible speaking of Christ, said, when he came. He said, I delight to do your will, God. I delight to do your will, God. Until we come to a point or moment in our lives where nothing matters outside the will of God. You see, you can't be a man who is, who is committed to the will of God and things are going wrong around you and you are still saying, hey, Lord, you know, I would have loved to do something for you, not me. I can't do it. You can't. Do you remember the scriptures where Apostle Paul said, For it is God who works in us, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. There is a willingness that God is working in us. Until that willingness aligns with his will, we will not be able to see through the eyes of God. When problems are persisting around us, we will not be able to see ourselves as the solution that the Lord is providing. Don't forget. When the children of Israel were crying in, in, in Egypt, God saw a need for them to be delivered. Now, until a man aligned himself with the will of God, if there was no man else, no one else that saw himself as a solution. Let me come into it. There was a problem. The children of Israel were in bondage. Now, nobody did anything about it until God came to open the eyes of a man to a need for solution. Now, the man was like their deliverer, but really God delivered them. And when God delivered them, God delivered them through a man. 
What I'm saying is that until that man became aligned with the will of God, until that man became exposed, got exposed to the will of God, he didn't see himself as a solution that the people were waiting for. Don't forget, he was in, at the backside of the desert for 40 years. At the 38th year, the people of Israel were still suffering. At that time, he didn't see himself as the solution. At best, he could just say, ah, one day, God will just deliver this people. Maybe Pharaoh will just sleep and we will wake up. That's how we talk. We just wish solution. We even create solution. We just wish it. But we usually pass the ball to other people. Say, Lord, it can't be me. I'm not the one. It can't be me. Why will it be me? Me, I don't have this. I don't even know this. I've never been to this place. But the truth is, the moment we get ourselves exposed with the will of God, all doubt will be removed. So the reason why we've actually been sitting down, as it were, hiding away, is because the will of God has not been revealed to us. Now, there's a place that I want us to read. John chapter 4, verse 34. John, the book of John, chapter 4, verse 34. Don't forget what we said. If you get exposed to the will of God, all your idleness <laughs> will vanish. So the reason why you are idling around is because the will has not been revealed to you. If we let us, before we read that John chapter 4, Pastor, you are welcome. Yes. Before we get exposed to that portion of John chapter 4, verse 34, let's look at it. How many of us have watched uh, ultimate, The Ultimate Gift? I know you have watched it. That, how many of us have watched The Ultimate Gift? The young man that eventually got inheritance from his grandfather, his grandfather. Now, until the man was exposed to the will of the grandfather, he was living an ordinary life. Now, if your father huh, <laughs> is the richest man in Africa, and by, by one reason or the other, you were never aware that he has weed all his property to you, even though you are just one of the sister children, there is a serious tendency for you to be living any kind of life until you realize that everything belongs to you. Let me give you a picture. Now, if somebody believes that we are even men, I'm not even sure we are even 16. Who knows whether my father even has some wives outside the country. Now, what you just tell yourself is the best thing we just do is to give me a car or give me one of those houses, one. So, there's a need for you to just tell yourself, oh, so I don't even care. Uh, and you can live your life. But imagine you knowing that 16 companies will be entrusted to you, you'll be the CEO, people that have PhD will be coming to you, they'll be sitting on the board, and you have to be making logical judgments. Eh? Oh! <laughs> if that kind of guy is aware of it, will anybody need to teach him or tell him to read or to prepare himself mentally, getting himself ready, emotionally ready for that kind of responsibility? But if he had always thought the best that could happen to him is to get a house, get a car, that's still easy to manage. Any fool can marry that kind of, marry that kind of inheritance, a car and a house. Now imagine him now realizing that there is a bigger plan in the heart of the Father concerning him. That's what we are talking about the will of God. It's the plan of God, a, big, a bigger plan. A plan that is larger than life. A plan that is larger than your current level. God has that plan just for you. You could have been thinking that, wow, you are just 16 million in your state. In fact, you are one and 60 million in your country. You are just one in one 60 million. God is just saying, no, don't be looking at the 16 million. Just look at yourself. Have a very grand plan for your life. Now, if you know that plan, you've been exposed to that will of God. Please, would you live any kind of life after that kind of understanding? I doubt not. So the reason why we live a mediocre life or we settle with mediocrity, the reason why we sit down waiting for God 
to raise somebody somewhere in another state, waiting for God to come all by himself, send down fire from heaven and kill all the politicians, send down something and just scatter everything. The reason why we are waiting for a revolution, the reason why we just believe things will work outside of our effort is because we think we are one in a million, one in one sixty million, one in seven billion. But the truth is, there is a specific plan for us. See what Jesus said in Hebrews. He said it, the psalmist said it in, in Psalms. The writer of Hebrews quoted it again in Hebrews chapter 10. He said, in the volume of the books, it is written of me. Don't forget what was said in Luke. Where Jesus found, Jesus was, was at the synagogue and the scriptures were given to him. And Bible says he found where it was written concerning him. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. So Jesus found where it was written concerning him. Mr. Bell, even though we could be 170 in the country, 170 million or 7 billion in the world, there is a place in the world, the word of God, that is written just for you. You can't find it and settle for small life. Because what is written concerning you is bigger than your thoughts. See, I know the thoughts that I think towards you. I know it. I'm not big about it. It's not maybe your life may work or not. Your life will work as long as your life is, is, is found in the world and is founded in the world. Your life will work. So, now, it is possible for us because of our selfishness to have to sit down and craft great visions for our lives, laudable visions for our lives, and wish ourselves good, and wish we are here, and wish we are there. No matter how creative our craftiness can be, it can never match the grand plan of God for our lives. So the will of God is not below your own plan, it's higher than your plan. Now Jesus said in John chapter 4 verse 34, he says, my food is to do the will of, of God, do the will of the one who has sent me, and to finish his work. He said, that's my food. Another pastor says, that is my need. He said, that's my need. That is where I find fulfillment. My fulfillment is to do the will. Now, if Jesus, if the fulfillment of Jesus was embedded in the will of God, and you call yourself a follower of Jesus, can your own fulfillment be outside of the will of God? No. Now, when we hear the will of God, we just think, we just imagine things. But the truth is, it is the plan of God for our lives. It is the plan of God for mankind that concerns us. So you can't be exposed to it, and you are yet outside of it. Let me even come again on that. Now, God has eternal plan. God has grand agenda. Now, the one that concerns you, that's what he will share with you. Now, you can't find that portion and yet be excluded in it. Imagine, let's, let's take for instance, the Lord is telling Peter, say, Peter, follow me and I will make you. That's the will of God for Peter. I will make you a fisher of men. Would Peter follow and eventually he would be excluded among the men that are fishing for other men? No, Peter was there at the center in the future. And even in the future to come, in the time to come, Peter, his name is also written on the foundation in the book of Revelation. So he did it. That's why he was like, who who follows me? We know something now. And the time to come. Now you can't accept the will of God for your life and your life, your interest, that your interest is excluded from the table. The rabbi people will say, you were not there. And you said, how do they distribute it? How do they share it? And you were not there. So you are not in the will of God for your life. And you are saying, how did it, how did it happen? 40 years old, 80 years old, 70 years old, there's nothing to show for it. Nobody knows you. You are just there. That is if the person even live up to it. At 60, the person is struggling with diabetes. Why God knew ahead of time, the way God packaged the body of that woman or that man, the way God packaged, the way God packaged and loaded the body, 
the body needed to be doing so, 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 and so every day to keep this body away from diabetes. Now, I'm not even talking about general, I'm talking about that particular man. He knew, God knew ahead of time that this body that fabricated requires this thing to be doing. This body needs to be traveling to villages. This body needs to be going to, to, to do this kind of things for this body to be healthy. Now you ask, call yourself from the will of the father, and yet you are complaining of diabetes as fifty. It's not the fault of God. It's just that the body has refused to be aligned with the design intent of the father. So the will of God for your life, which looks like something ahead of you, is actually something also behind you, which must also sustain you along the way. It's the reason for your making man, it's the reason for where you are going, it's the reason for how you are going. That's the will of God for your life. So your life is in the will of God, in your past, your now, your future. Everything about your life must be in the will of God. That is the only way to keep you healthy, to keep you safe, to keep you prosperous. I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in that. Even as your soul prospers, that thing cannot happen outside the will of God. Say, Lord, hear me. Outside the will of God, no way. Because what is the essence of keeping you healthy when there is nothing about God that moves you? Jesus said, when I was naked, you clothed me. Say, when I was in prison, you came to visit me. And they said, how did we do this thing? We didn't even see you. Ah, Jesus said, I know you know you didn't see me, but in as much as you did it, you did those things, those seemingly insignificant things, to these insignificant people in the society, you turned me to me. And God is saying, I've rest you up for that same purpose of doing it for them. And I said, no, I can't do it. It will make me uncomfortable. And yet you are missing the heartbeat of the Father to the world. The truth is there is a grand plan of God for all of us. There is a specific plan of God for you. The way you are looking, your beauty, you think you have will be outside. Another word, useless. Amen. I pray that the Lord we we in we press himself. Press his word in our hearts in Jesus' name. As we are concluding, we will still meditate a little bit about that John in the next five minutes. That John chapter 5, chapter 4, verse 34, where Jesus said, My food is to do the will of the one who sent me and to finish his work. Now, Emoji, when I was meditating, I, was, I saw a particular hand. A N D in that statement. I'm wondering, okay, for him to put and it means there are two different things. John 4:34. Are we there? Then Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Now, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. That's number one. But that is not all, man. You must also finish his work. He said, my food is to do his will. That's number one, is. And number two is to do his work. Man, there is his will for your life. And there is his work for your life. There is a will of God for your life. And there is a work of God for your life. A particular work. He says, that is my meat. That's where I find God. Whether I'm rich or not, that doesn't matter. Whether I'm loved or not, that doesn't matter. My joy, my fulfillment, my passion is to do His will and to, and to do His work. When God gave, when God revealed His heartbeat, His, his will to Moses, says about building the tabernacle, He said, make sure that you build the tabernacle according to the pattern. That's the word. Don't find the will of God for your life and try to figure out how to do it. There is a way to do the will of God. And that is the word of God. 
Now, do you, if we read that place where the scripture talks about uh, the diversities of gifts, the same spirit, diversities of ministries, the same Lord, diversities of activities, the same God. Do we remember that place? Now, as far as Jesus was concerned, there was the will of God for his life, and there was the work of God. He knew the work, and he was do. He knew the will, and he was do the work. Ma, there is a specific will of God for your life, and there is a way God wants you to do it. Don't just figure it out. You must find out for you. How do you want me to do it? What is the how? To fulfill this will of your life, of for my life, this is your will for my life. What is the how? How do I do it that I will not go into error? How do I do it that I will not overdo it? How do I do it that even when people want to make me king, I will know that I have not been called to be a king of this earth, but to be the king of kings? Don't forget, they wanted to make Jesus a king in Jerusalem. They wanted to define his scope of influence, but he knew it is God that defined his scope of influence. It is not man. He understood the work of God. He, he ran away from the designs of men, the dictations of men. So what are we saying? Has God shown you his will? Allow him to lead you on how to do it. The leadership of God over your life, as per his will for your life, is the work of God. How God orders your steps in his will. That's his work. So don't just know his will, man, sir. Do it as led by God. The scripture says, as many that are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. As many that God is responsible for the pattern of their expression in life, they are sons of God. As many that allow God to tell them what to do, when to do, and how to do, they are the sons of God. Amen. Amen. Our influence and our authority is in the will of God for our lives. You are a king in God's will for your life. In God's will for your life, you have no duplicates. You have no carbon copy. There is nobody like you. You have been created specifically, uniquely for that same purpose. You will only wish you are a king outside the will of God. You will not be it. Your kingship is in his will for your life. When God talked about your life, he fabricated you with so much dimension. And only he knows how to express the dimension of your life. So don't run outside of his way. Don't get outside of his way. Stay in his way. Be at the center of his way for your life. Marry in the will of God for your life. Send your children to school in the will of God for your life. Start businesses in the will of God for your life. Let nothing be done by you outside the will of God. God is looking for vessels who don't only know his will, but are committed to his will as he dictates. Men and women whose lives are founded on the word of God. Jesus said, in the book it is written of me. So, as it is written of me, he does. They told him to come to this. No, he said we have to go to these places. At the point, he said, my father walks in that home. I walk. He says, what I hear, I say, my judgment is true. I'm not doing things the way I want to do it just because I want to be fine. I want to do the way God wants me to do it. Lazarus, your friend, is dying. Come and pray for him. He's sick. He said, he said it's okay. And when he went, he said, this sickness is not to death. He said, it's for the glory of God. He said, Father, I thank you because you always hear him. Why will God not hear him? He was at the center of his will for his life. He was never in a hurry. He was never faster than God. He was never too slow behind. He was just at the center. That should be our hunger. That should be our desire. God is looking for such men and women. Men who will run the vision of God as they are led by the Spirit of God. Amen. Praise the Lord. I don't know what God has deposited into your, into your spirit tonight. But it is a great thing for us to pray. 
there's a need for us to commit ourselves to God. You remember that place in Acts where Apostle Paul said, I commend you unto God and to the word of the grace, which is able to build you up. There's a need for us to commend ourselves to God. To release ourselves to God. Says, I've done it my way. It doesn't work. Lord, let me take on your own way. I've tried to, I've, I've tried, I've, I've really worked out. Try to do this thing myself. Lord, it has not worked. Let me do it your way. So I want us to pray to God tonight. I want us to rise up. I want us to pray to God. It says, not by power of our mind, but by the Spirit, says the Lord. The Spirit of God leads us in the will of God. The Scripture says we don't even know how to pray as we ought to, but the Spirit makes intercession for us. With groanings that cannot be offered. The Spirit prays the will of God for us. The Spirit also leads us into God's way for our lives. Let's, let's, let's go ahead and communicate with God. Let's talk with God. I want it to be a personal conversation between us and God. No man is telling us what to say. Let us talk with God. Let us share our hearts with God. Let us expose ourselves to God. Let us be vulnerable before His presence. Let us talk to Him. I've tried it all by myself. I've tried to do it my own way. It doesn't work, Lord. Lord, I let go and let you have your way. Mais le monde se